having been part of that partnership with my family mm -hmm. and working together as a family mm -hmm has helped me understand that there's no problem that's not solvable. Mm. I think family businesses are beautiful. What have you learned about money? I've mm. not had money, I've mm. had money, I've had a bit of money, I've mm. had a lot of money, mm. I've seen a lot, of, I mean I've seen, I know the 360. I would say money is very important, but money is also the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. You know the thing about business, mm. it's it's got nothing to do with celebrity. Business is mm. business, business is practical, business is a game of numbers, mm. it's got nothing, it should not be emotive. Mm. So if it's not working, it's not working. Good evening and welcome to The Late Night Business. My name is Ian Dennis and tonight we have acquired an interesting episode lined up because I'm having a guest who's many other things, eh? a reality star, uh, an entrepreneur and also an advocate actually. And we're going to be finding out so much from the guests that I have tonight. But before I get to introduce my guest, I'd like to let you know that you're here at the Capital Club, the place that you need to be as an entrepreneur. As you always say, your network is your net worth. And at the Capital Club, you're guaranteed to build your net worth. The guest I'm speaking about today is none other than the founder of Posh, pa posh Palace. I've said Posh. Posh Palace. <laughs> she's very, very posh and she's also done so many different things. And I want to just to learn from her and just absorb from her particular experience. Susan Kaitani. Nice to see you. Looking beautiful as Ian, always. I'm so happy to be here. I think we've talked about doing this for a while. Yes. And I'm really proud of you. This is really, really nice. We're finally here. We're finally at the table. <laughs> ah, I, I'm not sure how hot it's going to be. Don't make it too hot for me. I would say you're really hot. <laughs> oh my God. But the I, first question I wanted to, I like asking every particular guest that I have, what exactly are you most grateful for today? Oh wow, I'm grateful for the gift of life. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for life. I mean, we take that for granted. I'm turning 40. I've been turning 40 the whole year, mm -hmm. but this is my first month. Uh -huh. September, so it's my lucky month. I'm really grateful. I'm a mom. I have two wonderful daughters. So I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for my family. And I'm just grateful for the experience, the, the human experience, you know, the small thing. Interesting. They always say life starts at 40. How does it feel? Uh, I know for women, it's, uh, we should be panicking, falling apart, mm -hmm. afraid, because, you know, apparently for women, that's 40 is, should be our decline. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's a beginning mm -hmm. for, for women, you know, for everyone actually, because you stop caring about people's opinions. You start, um, I think, looking inward and listening to your gut a bit more, being a bit more intuitive, listening to yourself and respecting yourself. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And when you look back, which has been your most interesting year so far? I think 40. Mm -hmm. I think getting to, I think 39 getting to 40 was really cool uh -huh. and different. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I took risks that I would normally not take. Mm -hmm. I, I have lived very boldly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I also have a podcast called Dangerously Honest. Yes. So I have lived very dangerously. Interesting. And I've been vocal. I've stood up for myself. Mm -hmm. I I think I, I speak up and I love it. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, two vital ages, or rather two vital decades for people between 20 and 30 and 30 and 40, maybe from between 20 and 30, what would you say were some of the lessons that you gathered during this particular period and what advice would you share for anybody within this particular phase and also the next phase between 30 and 40? I think 20 to 30, everybody is in a panic because everybody, I don't know whether you went through that season, yes. panicking. Like things need to happen. Yeah, you, you, you're broke. Mm. You're afraid you won't make it. Mm -hmm. You have all these big dreams. You see people driving big cars mm. and you're so, you're, you're panicking mm -hmm. and you're trying to, I know whether you're trying to play catch up, you're trying to grow up really fast yeah. instead of enjoying life mm -hmm. and live in your 20s. Mm -hmm. So when you're 20, you wish you were 30. Mm -hmm. When you're 30, you wish you were 40. Then when you're 40, you mm -hmm. wish you were 30. Mm -hmm. It's a paradox of life. So 20 year olds, I mean, they want to be older. They want to be respected a bit more. Yeah. And they, 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 they panic. They don't live in the moment, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of anxiety um, when you're younger, yeah. you know, I think it's also maybe you don't have much life experience You're not as wise as you are when yeah. you're older. You always think you're wise, but you're not. Oh my god, you're not, we're, <laughs> we're so far away there's from a, wise. There's a big difference between thinking you're wise oh, and being wise. Tell me about it. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I mean, um, I mean, I love being 40 because of the wisdom. Mm -hmm. I feel very unmoved by many things. Um, 20s was nice, but the shakiness of being 20, mm -hmm. listening to your friends, listening to opinions, I mean, listening to people who have 
no no good interests for you. That's what really sucks about being young, right? Mm, interesting. Yeah. And what would you say were the lessons you got that in that particular Oh my decade? god, it's like a whole book. Uh -huh. You know, Nika Makamusi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest yeah. lesson yeah. is um, when you're 20, you make so many mistakes. I think um, trusting too much, mm. trusting because you're young, mm. you know, going with the flow. Uh, belonging in a pack of friends, you know, mm -hmm. not really being bold enough to stand alone, yeah. you know, because you're afraid of having identity and mm -hmm. any real identity is scary for you, mm -hmm. you know. You want to say that I'm, you know, I'm friends with Ian, I'm mm -hmm. friends with, you know, this is yeah. my This pack. is my circle, this the is people my circle. I know, the yeah. who's who. You're so afraid of standing alone, yeah. you know. I think, um, I mean, of course, if I, had I known better, I would mm -hmm. have stood up for myself mm -hmm. a lot more. Mm -hmm at a younger age, I would have been able to speak up for myself, stand alone, make my decisions, and yeah, just be a bit more fearless, you know? So I think depending on people's affirmation was mm -hmm. my biggest and greatest mistake mm -hmm. when I was younger. Interesting. Yeah. And just now, so let me just take you back, because I always like to understand the background that you grew up in and how exactly it influenced you to be who you are today. Where did you grow up? Because I think... Susan just popped onto our <laughs> socials. <laughs> well, I grew up in yeah. a very close-knit family. My yeah. mom was a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can imagine when your mom is a teacher, we had to pass, you know? Mm -hmm. So I went to a national school. Uh -huh. you, what did mom used to teach where? My high mom, school? My primary school. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was rough, you know? Because uh -huh. like, you had to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. you know? Maths teacher. Ah. She's my music teacher, yeah. So. Interesting. So she taught maths and... English and music. So Molly Mohamad. When we talk about Molly Mohamad, it's Watch your mother. <laughs> the strokes. Very <laughs> oh, interesting. Huh? Yeah, so I mean, I, I lived, uh, it was quite strict, you know, mm -hmm. you had to do well in your education. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that was a non-negotiable. Mm. You have to do your chores. So mm -hmm. I think the values that I have right now mm -hmm. were inculcated in me from a young age. Interesting. Yeah. You grew up in a single mom, with a single no, mom no. or? Both my parents mm -hmm. are alive and mm -hmm. they're together. Mm -hmm. They've been married, I think, for over 40 years now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a happy marriage and it's a family of five kids. Five kids? Yeah. Number? Two. Number two? Yeah. Interesting. And <laughs> what did that, what was that doing? My dad um, actually incidentally worked at Kerry. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, you keep them yeah. shooting to Jitsa again, man. <laughs> you just have so to do the right thing. Letter. He's a tax collector. And your mom is Molly Mohamad. Oh my gosh. So can you not, no, does it explain everything? Does it explain me? The tax me? collector and the math teacher. I mean, I had nowhere to run. You uh -huh. just have to leave and do, you know, there's a very narrow, yeah, there's a narrow that is the path. Yes. Uh -huh. It's like the path to heaven. Interesting. And how was your upbringing like? How did they, what's it called? How, how did you grow up? Why did you grow up in how exactly? So I actually it? grew up in Langata, uh -huh. LA, as LA, used to uh -huh. call it. LA was cool those days. Uh -huh. um, um, but then, of course, moved onwards. Mm -hmm. But growing up in Langata was fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it was uh, very, I think I was sheltered. Mm -hmm. You know, my focus was more on the family. Mm -hmm more about education so studied a lot i was a nerd mm -hmm. used to go to the library to ah. the national library what did you study i studied in what do you mean uh your primary your secondary oh, yeah. i went to i went to a school in langata incidentally <laughs> called langata west uh -huh. but we were the best in nairobi my uh -huh. years you yeah, know, so with the 600 marks uh -huh. and the five i mean high uh -huh. 500s you know yeah. and then later on i went to kabarak then mckinney school uh-huh interesting yeah, yeah. and then I also read, you also went on and studied law. How, what did you want when you were a kid? Yeah. What did well, you want to be? I mean, my mom was a teacher. My, I mean, I've already given you the yes. background. Yeah. So I didn't have a choice. I had a big passion. I really wanted to become an interior designer mm -hmm. or like fashion because yeah. you know, I became a model thereafter. Uh -huh. I'm sure you also know yes. that. I won a pageant, mm -hmm. but my parents were like, you have to get the basic education, which I'm really grateful for now, mm -hmm. by the way, because mm -hmm. now I'm a lawyer. Yeah. You know, so I went to law school. Here but in I, Kenya? Or? Here in Kenya, mm -hmm. but I also worked in the family business full time. Ah, interesting. Yeah. And maybe just, uh, what's it called? You mentioned that your mom was a teacher, your dad was in Kiari, and primarily maybe they inculcated that element of education. Yes. But when you look back, what are the, some of the elements that you say that probably your parents really had a stronghold on you and maybe enabled you to become who you are today? Well, I think it's just um, the value of hard work. Mm -hmm. The fact that there were people who did the right thing, they didn't have money, yeah. they were simple people. My yeah. dad was a civil servant, oh. my mom was a teacher. These are very basic people. They came from straight from Shags, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the Nairobi story. Mm -hmm. First generation in Nairobi, mm -hmm. they don't have a fallback plan, mm -hmm. they don't have rich relatives. 
they just met relocated we live in a government house mm. simple basic family. in langata yeah yeah in rubia estate actually uh -huh. you know oh. so it was what, what they used to do was i remember them teaching us how to save mm -hmm. we'd count their savings every month and mm. put it yeah and put it under their bed in a box and oh. they take it out yeah. and we'd count all the money that saved yeah so every single month we'd count and they'd remind us you know like you have to keep saving you have to keep saving so it was just like um you have to live your life with values mm -hmm. And it's not about living a flashy life, it's mm. living a simple life, mm -hmm. living an even more simple life because you have to save. save yeah. And they always talked about the future. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, you know, we have to start a business eventually. You know, your dad is going to retire and mm -hmm. we don't have a business. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen? Yeah. You know, this is going to happen. What's the next? So they really included us in the family making decisions. Interesting. Yeah. So when was the family business uh, set up and uh, how was it like? Because primarily what I'm getting from you is that your parents really involved, yeah, what's it called? They involved you guys as children in their particular planning. In the, uh, when did the family business set up? Well, I think they didn't have a choice because they, my mom also was not too well educated being a teacher mm -hmm. at the basic level. So when we started going to school, she also depended on us to do the paperwork, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, type for me this email, uh, type for me this letter. You yeah. get, so she didn't, we didn't have a choice. We yeah. had to work together. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that it started, I think it's just, it, it, I can't say that it started when I was 19. Mm. All the way, because mm. you can imagine counting the coins, mm. you know, um, putting that money away, mm. having the conversations, mm. you know, um, making decisions together. So mm -hmm. I think my whole life mm. was just like, even before the business, yeah. there was a business, you uh, know. Because they, they were inculcating the aspect of being Absolutely. Yeah, financial acumen and Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Interesting. And you mentioned that you went into law school what was it uh, something you wanted to do or was Not it as really. a result of being mtoto wa mwalimu wa math mtoto wa mwalimu lazima afanye hilo mtoto wa mwalimu lazima kwe daktari so you just know yeah, it goes yeah uh -huh. the lawyers the doctors those days there was the, is it called the big five or the big mm. four i don't know yeah being a lawyer a doctor oh, an engineer yes of yes. course we have, my sister is a doctor mm. my brothers are engineers and i'm the lawyer yeah, yeah we have to have a lawyer you mm -hmm. know so i mean i went to law school at the time i was just ticking a box and maybe I didn't understand the value then because mm. I was just like, I can't believe I have to do law. I'm an arts person, yeah. you know. But I finished it because, I mean, in that family, you have to, you finish, have to finish, right? It, yeah. As mm -hmm. in, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. And you have to pass. Mm -hmm. There's no There's other no, option. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So I, I ticked that box, yeah. but now in retrospect, I'm really grateful. Interesting. So, and when did you join the family business or after finishing law or you're combining while you're oh, combine it you have to make it work uh -huh. you're going to work yeah actually i also started a branch uh -huh. my own business in eldoret uh -huh. when i was in law school and still oh, so you did, uh, 360. You, you did your universities in El yeah moi yes in moi university and, and what's what is the family business in what, what, the travel, what, it was a travel, the travel, travel agency, it was my business at the time, mm -hmm. but with time now it's become part of the grander mm -hmm. business, yeah, In and I was 23. Interesting, mm -hmm. and just take me through, how was, was it called, how was the initial phases of setting up the business, oh, how terrible. did you write the role within the family, because no. now it's a family business. It wasn't even that, a family business. It was your business, it and then the family business. came into place. Yes. Interesting, what, just take me through the earlier phases. So I was in law school, of course, I already had seen my mom setting up her business and I had helped time this. What know, had she set up? The travel agency. The travel agency, yeah, so uh -huh. I was like, you know, I mean, I could also do the same thing, you mm. know. So I called and I told her, is it okay if I use your name um, to open a branch? Mm -hmm. And she was just like, yeah, it's okay, but don't depend on me for anything else. Mm -hmm. You can imagine, so I didn't have money, yeah. put up an office somewhere. Opened it up, just That's bought in it in Eldoret, mm -hmm. in a building called Beacom House. Mm -hmm. And you know those foldable chairs? Yeah, yeah. The ones that are, there were some that had a red cushion. It was a bit more luxurious than the metal. It's still metal, mm -hmm. but it has a bit of cushion in it. Yeah. So I bought four of them, a basic mm -hmm. table, and opened. Mm -hmm. And I was like, anytime somebody comes in for a ticket, I'll be calling the Nairobi office and mm -hmm. asking them. And she's like, I don't care, you can do it, mm -hmm. but um, it's got nothing to do with yeah. me. Yeah. So um, it was quite something because I thought that clients would walk in. Mm. I opened the office and it was silence. I, I hired one or two people. We used to look at each other all day. And how are you doing this? Because you've set up your office you're in university, you don't have another source of income. Because I used to Skype classes. I mean, you have to uh, Skype so classes. How, how did you make money to sustain <laughs> you this? You have to. I yeah. mean, it was really tough. To mm -hmm. be honest, um, I've even said it before, Kanjo yeah. used to come. Uh -huh. Um, close the business up because of course I'm not paying yeah, the, the licenses, licenses yeah. you know 
and then I, I was really young. I, I mean, in my 20s, you, you're yeah. not confident, mm. you know? And I was waiting for clients to walk in. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. Yeah. Bef so long before I had to figure out, I had to go out and start hustling for clients, mm -hmm. you know? And it was the hardest thing. Because, ah. you know, you're young, mm -hmm. You're walking into established people's offices and mm -hmm. telling them I've opened a travel agency. Mm -hmm. And you're not even at a how you're not mm -hmm. feeling the confidence, yeah. yeah. And I remember in the beginning, um, I convinced a few clients to walk in because there was no walk in. Mm -hmm. I had to, I was the business, mm -hmm. you know. And when the clients came in, they were like, okay, I'm going to pay for these tickets to America mm -hmm. or whatever. They paid 200k. Mm -hmm. I never even seen 200k. Oh. No. So oh, I'm counting the, agent, the yeah. money uh -huh. and my hands are shaking. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I never seen yeah. so much money in my life, you uh -huh. know. Yeah, so it was quite. Scary. Mm -hmm. I would say it was scary because I didn't have money to back me up. Mm -hmm. I didn't have backing. Mm -hmm. All I had was myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So, as the travel agency, the services you provide apart from ticketing, what else? It was just ticketing in the beginning because I mean it had to be the basic stuff. Yeah. And you can imagine when a client walks in, I had to call the Nairobi office and so the Nairobi ask office is your to... mother. Yeah, of course. <laughs> And uh, where did mom learn about ticketing? And how did you learn about ticketing? That's a very long story. She yeah. opened, uh, she had a matatu. Mm -hmm. That was the money that we used to count. Uh -huh. And then somebody told oh. her, if you remove this matatu from the road and you put it in a hotel, mm -hmm. they turn it into a, uh, what is it called? The travel van. Mm -hmm. You'll make a bit more money. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got into travel. And then the travel van, she bought one more. And then she's like, okay, wait, instead of giving this van to the hotel, why don't I manage my own travel vans? Mm -hmm. So you see, that's a tour company, oh. right? So it yeah. was literally, what was it called? Like, say, life just worked itself yeah. out together. You, the dots connect. The mm -hmm. dots, your dots will always align. Interesting. Yeah. As so primarily, you used to run, quote unquote, the, the branch of the business in Eldoret. It wasn't a branch, it was my office yes. then. But then I started making more sales. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a day, I'd start bringing in more and more sales. Mm -hmm. And she was like, you know what? Let mm -hmm. me give you some credit facility. Mm -hmm. Instead of uh, you hustling to pay me, why don't I give you a million shillings mm. uh, revolving credit so that mm. you, every time you you get, you pay, I pay uh, her. You pay back, yeah, so she advanced you. So she advanced me. And then the advance grew to three million. Yeah. The advanced kept growing. Mm -hmm. you get, so that means that the business was growing, you know. Interesting. Yeah. And so your outfit of the business was different from the, the outfit that your mother was running. Yes. How did, did you ever get to merge it or that's how you trained for? So, um, I mean, eventually, of course, once I finished law school, I figured out Eldoret was too small for mm. me and I wasn't interested. But Eldoret probably has <laughs> a lot of rich people, the runners and everybody. Oh, but can you imagine mm. a Nairobi kid in Eldoret yeah, yeah. convincing them? I had to dress down. Mm. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. look a certain way. I was a bit <laughs> tired because I'm also like still, I still yeah. have that mm. fashionable element. I felt like Eldoret was a bit too small for me. Mm -hmm. And I needed a bigger city. Yeah. So then I had to give it up and I let it merge with a bigger business. So oh. put in structures. Mm -hmm. I really didn't want to live in Eldoret any longer. Yeah. I mean, I love my city, but yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big city girl. Interesting. Yeah. So you came to Nairobi and matched the business with your exactly. parents. Exactly. And how was that experience? How did you keep sanity through the business? Because I can try to imagine family business. Everybody has their own interests. You, how exactly is it? Yeah. Is I cannot say it's the easiest. Mm -hmm. um, to be, if I'm to be honest, mm -hmm. I mean, people who say it's easy, it's not easy mm -hmm. because. You are, you know, like, unlike everybody else who's in a family business, you get to walk away mm. and then you get to hook up and meet mm. whenever or yeah. whatever, maybe uh -huh. a family gathering, yeah, yeah. maybe lunch, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's cordial. There's no money that are mixed mm. up. There's nothing. Yeah. But in a family business, this, you don't get, you don't get an escape. Mm. You get, yes. you get to meet these people every, every day. single so day. So you're sharing will, the same home in yes. the same office. Okay, not home, maybe yeah. you've of course you've moved yeah. out to have your own mm -hmm. life. But every day you go back to work and guess who you're meeting? Mm -hmm. Your mother, yeah. your brother. Oh. oh, so everybody in the family came to be part of the business? My two, bro my two brothers are part of the business. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because now it's a bit much bigger business, you know. Mm. Um, they make turnovers of over two billion. Um, so, I mean, it even has a board. So, of course, it needs for more players. And mm -hmm. of course, now we're moving to the second generation. Mm -hmm. And you're putting in corporate governance. Interesting. Yeah. So just take me through uh, what's it called? The how you managed to put the sanity within the business. What was your role now within the business? What was your mother's role? What were your siblings' <laughs> role? How how exactly was it being structured? Yeah. Well it's it's I think it it's it family businesses, of course in the beginning they're all your kind. Mm. And I don't think it ever quite you can quite clean it up. It takes very many generations yes. 
to clean it up. Mm -hmm. So of course when I came back, mm -hmm. I worked in various departments, I was mm -hmm. in charge of groups, so I, I was in charge of like all the big, I think you heard of the business clubs, KCB, mm -hmm. the Ashara mm -hmm. Club, Barclays Business Club, mm -hmm. and CBA, and we're still doing that today. So mm -hmm. I was in charge of that, so I used to travel with all the different business clubs mm -hmm. across the world mm -hmm. for exposure, that was my department. Yeah. I've worked in ticketing, I've worked in all, so mm -hmm. really, I understand the business uh -huh. 360, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, of course, over the years now, uh, it's grown. Mm -hmm. So now I sit on the board. Yeah. My mom is the chairperson. Mm -hmm. My brothers, we are now directors. Oh, we're yes. now getting to, to, to a place. Uh, we're actually going through a restructuring process mm -hmm. and actually Especially working mm -hmm. on the governance corporate structures. governance. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. You mentioned that. So the business that you, you said you started off or maybe you advanced a million shilling, grew up to two billion. Yeah. Within what particular lifespan? Well, it's not that one only when we combine it. I mean, mm. so that one opened up a, a Kisumu office. You know the ah, way it spreads? Uh -huh. Yeah, because it was an Ayata office. But you see, at least I was brave enough to move out mm -hmm. and create a foundation elsewhere. Because it's very hard to start a business. True, true. And it's very hard to have a branch that will work mm -hmm. if it doesn't have the roots, you mm -hmm. know, because I was well known in Eldoret. Yeah. So it was easier. Um, so I would say that combined, of course, maybe these other branches are doing close to over 500 million and mm -hmm. what have you. Also it's combined it's different combined. particular combine, branches all yeah. across Kenya. Yeah, we don't have too many. Mm -hmm. um, we keep it lean mm -hmm. but effective. Interesting. Yeah. So on that particular note you're going to take a short commercial break and then after the break you're going to just still embark on this particular journey. then to set up a uh, what's it called being part of the family business the family business has grown so for how long were you part of the family business and at what particular point now did you just want to just ensure that you're part of the board and go set up Posh Palace well you know of course being part of a family business means you've sacrificed a lot mm -hmm. especially as a working member of the family you know there's different types of family businesses there are others who are only sitting maybe they are shareholders mm -hmm. And yet we were yet to create the corporate governance mm -hmm. and we're still in the process of creating corporate governance mm -hmm. so uh, for me i feel that um i felt like i had given up a lot mm -hmm. of myself to sacrifice for the family and yet i love fashion mm -hmm. i love beauty it's, you know there's a there's a sadness and a yeah. hunger that mm -hmm. you still have oh because you had to sacrifice a lot yeah, to be part of it yeah including doing law mm -hmm. you know <laughs> I, mean, so yeah. I was so far away from you know and also supporting my family's dreams supporting my parents you know so you find yourself very far away from who you truly are supposed to be mm -hmm. you know i had wanted to become to become a tv star mm -hmm. i had wanted to become a model mm -hmm. i had wanted to get a career in modeling mm -hmm. or fashion mm -hmm. or you know beauty mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so i felt that there was a need for me to not be live in regret yeah and be able to manage myself mm -hmm. or live a dual life you know yeah. uh -huh. they say how people are at least able to do three things mm -hmm. the one thing they're passionate about their job that they have to do and then i'm not sure what the third thing is supposed to be maybe something philanthropic mm -hmm. philanthropic Philo yeah. yes but uh, it's the duality of life. Mm. You're not just one thing. True, true. Yeah, you're, you're not one. Things. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I think the recognition of that mm -hmm. led me towards um, now founding Porsche mm -hmm. and just engaging myself in things that would give me joy mm -hmm. and give me happiness. You know, interesting. More than a business, actually. And because setting up Porsche, it's a Porsche place. Uh, what's it called? It's classy. It yeah. targets a particular kind Clientel. of clientele. Why, how did you get the capital for that? Why, had you sourced it from the other business? In the other business, did you used to get dividends or you been paid a salary? <laughs> Wait, there was how no exactly? corporate governance yes. uh -huh. yet, so there's no So how did you dividends. get the funding for that? Well, I think I, um, at the time, hmm. um, small savings. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean like, you know, I had sacrificed a lot. So you save, 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 and of mm -hmm. course I understand the value of savings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had also had my little side hustle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I was ready. But nothing still prepares you. I mean, For, business is yeah. business. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter how many times you do it. Mm -hmm. It's the same process again and again and true, again. True, true. Yeah. Interesting. And when you set up uh, Porsche, you had uh, this particular big partnership and this all big fallout that was all over. 
take us through the nitty gritties of how that came to be. I think I've talked about that so many times. <laughs> I know. You probably even asking yourself. I mean, you know the thing about business, mm. it's it's got nothing to do with celebrity. Business is business. Mm. Business is practical. Business is a game of numbers. Mm. It's got nothing. It should not be emotive. Mm. So if it's not working, it's not working. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a numbers game, isn't it? Mm. It's about investments. So as a lawyer, I mean, it's also about being practical. So if it's not working, the best thing I always tell people if a partnership is not working, let mm -hmm. it go. And you're better off starting again because mm -hmm. in the end, just like a family business, yeah. you'll have to have proper setups for the future, you mm -hmm. know. And there's so much at stake. Mm -hmm. And I think I understand that fully because I'm in a family business. Already. Interesting. And out of the experience, because I know maybe you learned quite a number from the family business. Yeah. You learned a lot from the, what's it called? The break, quote, 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 yeah. break up within the, the particular partnership. Yeah. What have you learned about partnerships? Because I know in life you cannot dismiss partnerships, no, something cannot. that can always come to be. I what do you look at now? Partnerships should not be emotive. Mm -hmm. um, partnership is a very serious thing. It's like a marriage, mm -hmm. you know. So if you get married and you're not thinking it through, mm -hmm. you, you didn't vet, do the correct vetting mm -hmm. during dating, you did not, you were moving with your emotions or the excitement or the thrill of it. Mm -hmm. You're looking at it as an adventure mm -hmm. as opposed to the paperwork, mm -hmm. you know. There has to be very clear partnership deeds. Mm -hmm. There has to be very clear, you know, um, clauses that talk about breakups, that put in, and you have to do the papers right. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes when you're younger, you're led by emotions, mm -hmm. a bit of excitement, mm -hmm. a bit of, you know, you want to do something fun with a friend, yeah. you know, yeah. as opposed to mm -hmm. putting in structures yeah. that will guide mm -hmm. um, proper situations like that. When you, when you face challenges with a partner, what happens? Interesting. You, know, you can't just go like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, this guy is my buddy, we, mm -hmm. we came from Campo together, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, then when this business grows, what happens? Yeah. Then when you get married, what happens? Mm. Then when he gets, you, there's so much, much at yeah. play. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. And one of the things that you were talking earlier on off camera is in terms of the period that it took for the business to break even. You mentioned it took oh, it more than... it takes forever. Yeah. <laughs> Just how exactly were you, how are those years before the business I mean, even gets to break hard. even? It's That's mm. why they say new businesses always close. Mm. Most businesses, 80% of new businesses shut down below the age of three. Mm. If you celebrate your third birthday as a business, you've made it to the 80, 20%. Yes. Yeah. So there's a very high likelihood if you're in your fourth year, mm -hmm. you'll survive. Mm -hmm. Even for banks, when they're looking at your paperwork, yeah. they look for businesses that are hopefully yeah. above Please the age audited of, accounts for yes, the last three, three years. years. <laughs> you're like, you're one year old. You're ah, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I mean, you have to be able to show that you will survive mm -hmm. because that survival period is nothing but tenacity. Mm. Do you have what it takes? Do you have the grit mm. to survive the winds? Do you have the grit to survive farming? It's farming, mm. it's wind, it's everything yeah. that could go wrong. Mm -hmm. They say it's equivalent to, is it equivalent to the seventh year of marriage? Mm. They say, I wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'd know. They call no, it just, the seventh year I, I'm, 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 I'm just new, less than three yeah, years. So I, I don't so. know. That ring looks very new. Yeah. I, like, I think I'm talking to the wrong It can guy. be polished. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, but um, just looking back, because I know sometimes you you're a fashionista, you post going out and all that stuff. People see the posh side of you, but I like just take us through the hard times that you've experienced running the business, because I, I know it's not all oh, all glamour glam. as it but looks I like. I think I do the glam things mm -hmm. because that is my passion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to cheer myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, social media for the yeah. that I have had to yeah, For the pains. It's, for, yeah. it's like a celebration because honestly, life and running a business is not easy. Mm -hmm. And nobody, okay, people talk about it, but until you experience it yourself, mm -hmm. you will never understand mm -hmm. just how tough that journey is. Um, there's not enough business support. There's not enough friends who walk you through it. It's a very lonely journey. Mm -hmm. And I think now, of course, I've understood it. Yeah. Uh, you get used to the loneliness. You mm -hmm. get used to the hard work. You get used to losses you get used to i mean it becomes in fact you laugh it off you know mm -hmm. nothing things stop moving you you know um to walk you through these many months you would not be able to meet your overheads mm -hmm. many months maybe you'd be late on rent mm -hmm. many months you know the real issues mm -hmm. leave alone the the fluffy ones yeah you know yeah. guys never talk about it guys don't want to talk about like you know what happens when you know your yeah. electricity is switched off yeah. because you didn't pay your electric electric bill mm -hmm. which was over 200k mm -hmm. guys don't want to talk about those issues but those are the real issues that real business people face mm -hmm. um when you don't have enough running capital mm -hmm. when you don't have um enough cash to keep the company fluid mm -hmm. 
when you don't have when you have to look for a loan mm -hmm. to keep your business liquid mm -hmm. when you don't have maybe even assets mm -hmm. that can give you security yeah. you know I mean, I mean it's endless interesting yeah. what would you say has been the toughest period that you've experienced so far that your back was pushed against the wall oh, and you never so thought you would come out of it there's been many uh, but then I think also, to be honest, I have a very supportive family. Mm. I think I understand that already working together, because now our business is close to 30 years, mm. and I have been part of it from day one. Mm -hmm. So having been part of that partnership with my family, mm. and working together as a family, mm. has helped me understand that there's no problem that's not solvable. Mm. You get it? Mm -hmm. It's almost like it sharpens your problem-solving mm -hmm. skills. If you, if you crack your mind, there's always a solution. There's a True. call that mm -hmm. can fix your issues. Yeah. And also, it's not going to be a friend mm -hmm. a lot of the time. True, true, true. You get what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's always family. Yeah. Friends come second. Oh, never friends. Uh -huh. you know, so it's going to be a family, maybe a client, mm -hmm. maybe your banker, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, so pick up that call, mm -hmm. make a call, and then don't be shy to share your problem mm -hmm. with people you trust. Mm -hmm. You know, could be a friend or a mentor. Mm -hmm. Could be, you know, there's people who have gone before you. Mm -hmm. You're not the first person to, you're not reinventing the wheel. Interesting. Yeah. And in terms of your experience so far, uh, what's it called? Being part of the family business, trying to set up your own particular enterprise, and the journey so far, what would you say has have been the biggest lessons that you've actually you can actually share that when you're doing or starting a business, you need to do A, B, C, D. Yeah. So if you're starting a, I, okay, I can talk about family businesses. Mm. I can talk about independent yeah. businesses because I've experienced both. both. Yeah. I think family businesses are beautiful, mm. but a family business is family first. Mm. We always say that, and I think for me the biggest lesson is. You cannot run a business, a family business, if you don't have good relationships and mm -hmm. great relationships. Mm -hmm. that's, why you, that's why you see families struggling at the end of it when um, the founder passes away mm -hmm. or it's passed on to the second generation because of relationships. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing in a family business is relationships and building them mm -hmm. and not building them as a by the way, mm -hmm. being very, very conscious mm -hmm. about it. Because if you don't work on those relationships, mm. it'll come back to bite you. Mm. These are the same people you'll be fighting with yeah. when it moves to the second generation. If at all you're going to get into the second and third and fourth, and if yeah. you want this business to last into a hundred years mm -hmm. plus, Interesting. it's about relationships. And you've mentioned the aspect of keeping your relationship very tight-knit. And I know in any particular business, shareholding plays a big role. Absolutely. So in the family business, there's a first generation that forms your mother and your, your dad and your mom. Yes. Second generation is you and your siblings. Yes. So how have you divided the business amongst yourselves? So now we're in the process of that, actually. Mm -hmm. we're, in the, we're in the, I don't know whether I should be talking about yeah. this. Yeah, just, yeah. But yeah, we're in the middle of the uh, process of moving into the second generation. It's not an easy process, mm -hmm. going corporate, because yeah. it means putting in the structures. Mm -hmm. It means... Um, Facing all the challenges mm -hmm. that uh, a young business mm -hmm. faces into maturity, mm -hmm. you know, and then also letting go of a bit of power, mm -hmm. you know, because becoming corporate means yeah, yeah. letting go mm -hmm. and having um, the power lie with the management the and the management. executive. Yeah. You know, it's no longer a family. You're only there for oversight, mm -hmm. you know. Interesting. So it means stepping back mm -hmm. and not being, uh, I guess, I would call it. Um, micromanagement you know because you know maybe in a family business all family business start off with micromanagement yeah, yeah. you know yeah, yes your uko your everything you have to check out everything yes. before you get to advance yeah so now we have a ceo mm. and it means you have to step back and trust and put mm. in processes work with kpis mm. set up a board true uh set up advisory boards mm -hmm. set up you know i mean proper corporate governance mm -hmm. So it's a lot of emotional, it's a very emotional journey, mm -hmm. stepping back, you know, and, and getting into corporate and even education, mm -hmm. you know, educating yourselves and what this corporate governance is about. Interesting. And you also mentioned in terms of maintaining that particular close family relationship. Assuming that you work together and primarily also you have family meetings and the like, so family is such a tight knit. How do you keep that sanity? That is, that yeah, is how do you guys manage to keep that sanity? Because it's not, it's I can not try to imagine, sanity. I'm like, I with you, I probably have spent a huge, significant part of my life with you. Then you're also in business. How do you guys keep that sanity? Do you have so rules? Do you have boundaries? Yeah, there has to be like a, I mean, you have to work on a, as a family on the family constitution. But you know, those are just documents. Mm -hmm. You cannot run away from issues. Mm -hmm. You have to sit down and break down the issues that you have. Because these mm -hmm. are people who mm -hmm. you have shareholding with. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't work out between you guys, it's not, you can't quite get a divorce. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you, you can't divorce, divorce from family. Yeah, family, yeah, family, family is there for it. life. Yeah. yeah, especially if you're in a family business. Mm -hmm. So how do you get a divorce from your own family mm -hmm. that you have shareholding in and mm -hmm. that you have a family business with you get? Mm -hmm. So it's a lot more complicated. And that's why relationship management, I believe, in a family business mm -hmm. comes before anything else. Mm -hmm. Yes. How do you guys manage it? I'm um, like, still, do you say all the calls? <laughs> I know you're like this, you're like this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all types of chaos. Mm -hmm. But uh, I believe that uh, it needs a lot of humility, mm -hmm. maybe a bit of guidance. Mm -hmm. um, you must involve other players. Mm -hmm. um, who's the same person within the family? When there's an issue, who's the one who resolves it? So that's the thing. You yeah. have to have outside players. I mean, to ah. guide you through corporate governance. Because I don't believe there's any family business that can become corporate mm -hmm. without... And third said, players, you, mm. you must have consultants mm -hmm. to walk you through the process. Mm -hmm. You must have third parties. Interesting. Yeah. Another thing I'd also like to learn from you is that by yourself, you've built your brand by yourself. Uh, you recently did the Real House of, of Na Nairobi. Uh, what's it called? You're very outgoing. You've built your own particular niche, but you're also into business. How do you, does building your own particular personal brand have an effect on the business? And if it does, is it positive or negative in terms of your own outlook? Well, it's complicated. I've mm. actually had to think a lot about that because mm -hmm. more and more in life, businesses and personalities become one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. You look at Kim Kardashian and mm -hmm. Skims, they're one and the same thing. It's mm -hmm. very hard to separate the person and the business. Mm -hmm. uh, so for myself, I'm a very private person. Mm -hmm. So I believe that with my family business, it's a bit separate. Mm -hmm. Of course, more than ever now, whenever they go somewhere, they're asked, oh yeah, are you related to so-and-so? Mm -hmm. Do you have the same surname, you know? But I like to separate it mm. for myself because I believe that uh, a business is an entity on its own mm. and it should be able to stand on its own and it should be able to stand the test of time, whether yeah. I'm in this world or yeah, not. not yeah. It should be able to run um, yeah. its course mm. you know, on its own. So if a business is not able to survive without me, then I will not feel like that's a viable business. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I like to think of them as separate entities and building my personal brand is purely just for myself. Mm -hmm. And my dream, like mm -hmm. I told you, yeah. <laughs> that I had steered very far away from mm -hmm. in um, joining my family business. Interesting. Yeah. And what, because you also did the reality in Nairobi or whatever, the Real House of, the, under the particular, what was it called? The Real House of Na Nairobi. How exactly was that experience for you? And why did you want to do it? Is it because you wanted to go for that dream that you didn't? Yeah. And life has allowed you now yes, to do it? Yes, yes. I think at the time, of course, I told you, I had yes. even tried out yeah. for a role in KTN. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to do Out and About mm -hmm. many years back. Mm -hmm. And then something happened. Mm -hmm. And TV has always been one of my passions. Mm -hmm. you know, because I'm a public speaker. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been a model. So mm -hmm. it was not hard for me to make that decision. Mm -hmm. But I guess I did not anticipate the amount of drama that there would be. Because I'm also not a socialite. Mm -hmm. I am business mm. person so i mean it was an interesting experience because mm. of course i mean fashion i mm. loved i enjoyed showcasing myself but i didn't enjoy the drama part of mm. it the booming mm. and everything else that went on mm -hmm. yeah so i mean i'm a, a lot more conservative mm -hmm. and so yeah it, it, ha it did have its roller coasters but such is life right interesting yeah and when you look at it in terms of what's it called Having been this lady, this girl back then who dreamt of actual, I was it called, actualizing this particular dream of yours, maybe going through that phase of having to be part of the family business and eventually getting to see your dream and what exactly you'd imagined in all ways coming to reality, how does it feel? You know, you don't even, um, I even forget that that was my dream because I'm yeah. truly so busy trying to mm -hmm. be sure that I've lived. Uh, to my utmost. They say, even Oprah Winfrey says, mm. if you're going to live, you better live at your highest. Mm. Whatever dream you had, mm -hmm. whatever you hoped you would be, you should mm -hmm. leave it to your absolute highest. Mm -hmm. So I think I've been so busy trying to live to my absolute highest. Mm -hmm. I'm so afraid of being buried mm -hmm. with all my dreams, mm -hmm. you know. So I guess now you're making me reflect and yeah. actually see that I've actually checked all my boxes, which is unbelievable. Yeah. Someone also asked me the other day, now that you've turned, you're turning 40, now I'm 40 mm. this month. Mm. Um, how does it feel? Um, do you feel like you have any regrets? Do you feel like um, there's anything you could have changed in mm -hmm. your life? And I would say absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I've ticked every single box, you know. Mm -hmm. And now I guess the next chapter is Uncharted Waters because yeah. I, I literally checked all my boxes already. I have yeah. to figure out what I want to do for the rest of my life. You know? Interesting. Mm -hmm. There's something, and uh, what was it called? I like to discuss about money. You'd mentioned that growing up, your parents instilled to you the aspect of saving. Yeah. And I know money is such an important aspect because you'd mentioned that you grew up 
sort of like quote unquote in luck because your parents were in civil serv yeah. servants and stuff. What have you learned about money? Because you've gone, you've experienced small money, you've experienced big money, as you've mentioned through the company revenues to time. Yeah. What, what are some of the lessons you've learned about money? Oh my money? gosh, I think I've seen all types of whatever. I've mm. not had money, I've mm. had money, I've had a bit of money, I've mm. had a lot of money, mm. I've seen a lot. Of, I mean, I've seen, I know the 360. I'll say money is very important, but money is also the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. Um, we need money to live, we mm. need money to survive. Mm -hmm. Money gives you freedom, money gives you choices and mm. options. Mm -hmm. The lack of it brings suffering, mm. but also too much of it um, is damaging, you know. How would you say that? It's damaging to what extent? I mean, you've seen people who money changes them. Mm. It, it makes their egos mm. inflated, it makes them evil, mm. it makes them mean to people, mm. it makes them arrogant, mm. it makes them... Money comes with power, mm -hmm. you know? True. So the question is, how responsible mm -hmm. are you going to be when you make money? Because you, know, you see all types of people who have made money mm. and it has completely changed them, even a bit of money for mm. some socialites, you know? Interesting. How have yeah. you managed to keep your feet on the ground through it? Having experienced none and experiencing this, yeah. experiencing fame. And you've mentioned you've ticked all your boxes and just at 40, something that most guys usually maybe take a lifetime and may not achieve. How yeah. do you manage to keep your foot on the ground? I think to be honest, um, life is real mm -hmm. and we are going through the human journey. Mm -hmm. Money does not fix everything. True. Money cannot bring you happiness. Mm -hmm. If you think that you're going to be, oh, when I make this amount of mm -hmm. money, I'll be happy now. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. If you cannot, and I know that because yeah. I've experienced it, mm -hmm. So I think my, my biggest, what I would say mm -hmm. about what makes me grounded mm -hmm. is um, the fact that I've really worked hard mm -hmm. to get to where I am. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that money doesn't come easy. Mm -hmm. So when you work mm -hmm. hard and follow all the steps to, mm -hmm. towards making money, mm -hmm. I don't think you look have that outlook towards money that mm -hmm. is uh, toxic. Mm -hmm. You'll have a more holistic approach towards it. Mm -hmm. You will be grounded. Mm -hmm. I think money even make, could possibly even make you more humble. Mm -hmm. Uh, because with more, it should make you more. It makes me more humble. I, mm -hmm. I don't say I have a lot of money, but exposure I think brings humility. Because mm -hmm. you know, you, you've, I've seen a lot. I've yeah. traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. I've met lots of great people, mm -hmm. and it makes you more humble because you realize the little money you have is nothing in the grand scale of things. You know. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe before you come to an end, I have some quick fire questions. Okay. <laughs> oh, <finally>. <laughs> <laughs> um. So let me just get into it. What's the greatest risk you've ever taken? I think to get on the Real Housewives of Nairobi. Why? Let me ask why. Yeah, it's a quick Because I mean, it, you don't have any control over it. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have any editing rights. You have no idea how you're going to. Oh, so you just do your drama just and life it moves with on. Everybody, you don't know, don't know who the other cast are. Yeah, so I mean, you literally is like stepping into the line of fire. Interesting. Yeah. What's your hidden talent? Wow, uh, my hidden talent is I can sing in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> I sing in the shower uh -huh. alongside to all this crazy music. Yes. And I can rap. You can rap? Yeah. Same here. I also feel like I'll be a rapper though. My oh, producer nice. doesn't think the same. <laughs> we, should, we should give it a shot. <laughs> Maybe I just should rap presents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to rap me a present. What's one of your nicknames? Oh, Pat Saidi. That's <laughs> my mom's nickname for me. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, money or happiness? Happiness. Uh, what do you think the meaning of life is? Oh, I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> the meaning of life, I think the meaning of life is life you're just supposed to meet people and walk that journey and sharing. Mm -hmm. And sharing the beauty that life is. And sometimes you forget to do that. Mm -hmm. To the people that you're working with, mm -hmm. your children, your partner, it's just about experiencing nature experiencing mm. people and the mm. beauty that life is you know mm. and you know smelling the roses not forgetting to be present and just seeing how beautiful the world is and it's yeah what scares people. you what scares me it used to be death not anymore mm -hmm. um i think now what scares me is illness interesting um what's been your best age 40. <laughs> i'm 39 point yeah. something something but 40 for sure and the final question freedom or money freedom Interesting. Maybe another one question before okay. we even get to end. I'm trying to look for the one that's interesting one. Uh, would you climb a mountain or you jump on a plane? Jump, jump off a plane? 
I've jumped off a plane already, so <laughs> I think I'll climb a mountain next. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much for the conversation. I've really, really gotten to enjoy it. I've had such yeah. a good time, and it looks like you might be setting up a family business soon from, yes, the, from yes. the sound of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I can tell. I can tell. I'm, a, I'm ahead of you, so <laughs> I'll be here for all the emotional yeah, For the, all the emotional support. Oh my gosh, yes, yeah, 20 years in. <laughs> Thanks so much for the conversation. You're Maybe welcome. just a final uh, aspect from you. Uh, what's it called? What's that one lesson that 40 years has taught you? That one lesson that you can actually share to anybody watching this? One life, one chance. You only live once. Mm -hmm. So live, live it at your possible highest. Whatever your highest mm -hmm. is. Make sure all your dreams come true. Interesting. And don't let anybody say no to you. Interesting. Yeah. And every, you are yeah. the driver of your own your own journey and yeah, your own life. Absolutely. Own it. Own your life. Own your journey. I've really, really enjoyed this particular conversation. That was Susan Caetani, the founder of Posh Palace and also this also Pol Polish. Polish. Um, yeah. um, Posh Palace and uh, Reserve Trip. Mm -hmm. A lot of things. Interesting. So much that you've learned <laughs> and around. Dangerously honest. And Dangerously Honest. She's also a podcaster, Dangerously Honest, that's on Spotify. And we've learned so much around family business and how exactly the family business is supposed to be run. That has been the Late Night Business. My name is Ian Dennis. And as always, we're coming to you from the Capital Club, the place that you need to be every particular who's who in this particular part of Kenya, in this part of Africa, is part of this particular club. And you can have a lot of access to your net worth here at the Capital Club. My name is Ian Dennis and this has been the Late Night Business. Until next time, right here, I'll see you on the Late Night Business.